Hey, everybody, and welcome to Generative Now. This is the show where we talk to the builders who are creating the world's most exciting AI products and companies. I am Michael Magnano. I'm a partner at Lightspeed, and I am very excited for today's episode. Uh, I talked to Gustav Soderstrom, the co-president, chief product officer, and chief technology officer at Spotify. Gustav is responsible for all things product, technology, AI, machine learning uh, for the world's largest audio streaming platform. Uh, he was also my boss uh, at Spotify when I worked there for a couple of years after selling my company, Anchor, to Spotify. And so we've long had many debates about things like product, business, strategy, um, and AI. And we continued those debates and those conversations today in this podcast episode in which we talked about action-based agents and what the future of AGI holds for us. So I really think you're going to enjoy this one. Take a listen to my conversation with Gustav Soderstrom. Hey, Gustav. Hey, Mike. Great to see you. Good to see you. So uh, normally we'd uh, catch up, say hello, you know, small talk. But you and I, when we get talking, we could we could talk for hours. So we're going to dive right into it so we don't waste any time. So I want to talk about Spotify a little bit before we get into some more general AI stuff. But, you know, people don't really think of Spotify as an AI company, but I kind of think of think of it as the first true AI consumer product company. Uh, give us a brief story of the history of sort of machine learning driven personalization at Spotify. I like it. I like it. I, I think there's some truth to this in the sense that uh, Spotify started like most services in sort of a you know, late 90s to early 2000s or, or almost 2010s as a curation service. So the name of the game back then was to take some some good like books or music or movies, digitize them, and then get users to sort of catalog them for you or organize them or curate them, if you want to use a fancy word. So, so that was Facebook. You digitized your friends, and then you got people to curate them, the friends into groups and graphs. It was Amazon with books and so forth. And Spotify was the same. The catalog was digitized by the MP3, and then the MP3 was sort of separated from the CD. There was piracy, obviously, and so forth. And so, so music was digital. But what Spotify did, it asked users to curate these things into playlists, right? And so the, the user was doing work for themselves to create a good, great music session, but they also helped other users by creating these playlists because they were public and shareable, right? But what also happened was as the users curated these playlists into groups, it also generated a lot of data about what songs go together. And, and pretty early on, I joined Spotify in late 2008, 2009. There were already some people at Spotify who knew Machine learning. Back then, it wasn't so much neural networks. It was more collaborative filtering and so forth. Um, but already back then, some people were experimenting with taking these playlists and see if you could create, using collaborative filtering, um, vector spaces that could describe these similarities between tracks. So, so really, the training, the, the playlisting was the training data for Spotify. And, you know, already tens of years ago, we had billions of these curations of tracks that go well together. So in that sense, we happen to have a lot of training data without really that being the goal. Uh, but to the credit of, the, of these people, they realized pretty early on that this was great training data. And so we started investing in recommendations. And at first, these recommendations were a support to the curation, right? So the first thing you would see was would be similar artists on the artist page, right? So it's kind of a hidden feature, but we could see that people really love these similar artist things. They would just click through the graph of similar artists. And so then more and more, we started saying like, well, if we understand which artists you might like, maybe we could just suggest some tracks from these artists that you might like as well. And we sort of pivoted from, from curation into recommendation. And that was fortuitous for us because the technology kind of developed at the same time. But in that sense, we were actually pretty early before the whole sort of what, maybe 2015 machine learning wave that happened. Um, and we started sort of pivoting the company from curation first to recommendation first. Now, obviously, you can still curate. You can still create your own playlist and so forth. But more and more, the core promise of Spotify is the, the personalization and the recommendations. And, and if you think about it, that makes sense for us because music in itself is a commodity product. You can get the exact same tracks on any music service for roughly the same price. So it's very important to us that we bring some additional value. And, and more and more that value transitioned from being curated playlists into being recommendations and how well we understand you. 
that data must be so, so powerful and so unique. If you think about some of these other services that are, you know, recommending content algorithmically, they're doing it by making a guess based on what people are, are maybe watching for more than they're watching something else, like how long they're looking at the screen. But, but in the case of Spotify, these users specifically said, I want to listen to this track next to this track. Yeah. It feels like one of the most powerful data sets there could be for media. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, in most other spaces, um, you know, movies and, and even podcasts for us, you have the, consu the uh, consumption signal, like someone yeah, exactly. listen to this and then listen to that. But that's, that's less powerful than this explicit curation. Someone saying exactly. literally like these five tracks, they go together. You know, because it's it's something, and then we can try to understand what that something is. So it's it's a very explicit data set. Yeah, it's really cool. So AI has, in many ways, then been sort of in the background of Spotify for a while now with with the curation, as we just talked about. But it's it's sort of making its way into the foreground now uh, with things like AI DJ. Uh, some of the new playlists that you've you've come out with are even more leaning into AI, what are some of the other areas of the product that uh, you're going to be applying AI to sort of on the user facing side? So, I mean, I think you can look at it uh, practically and, and look in all the places where we're going to use it. And you can also think about it philosophically. I think um, if we start actually philosophically, I think the way to think about it is exactly what you said. When we started with AI, as I said, it was in support of the UI. Yeah. So like the AI was supposed to help the UI, but the UI was the product. At least that's how we thought about it. And recently this is switching. Now the UI is there to help the AI and the AI is actually the product. And you think more and more about it. What is it that we're trying to do? Well, we're trying to build some sort of approximation of, of you really and your tastes in music, podcasts, and audiobooks. And we're trying to understand and predict how you would react to this track, this podcast, this book. So we're trying to model you, and that model is actually inside the weights of the neural networks. And that is, the, that is the real product. That is what you're paying for. So we started saying internally that the AI is the product, and the UI is there to help the AI as much as possible, and help the user, obviously. So you want the, the, the UI to help give you as strong signal as possible from what the user actually wants to hear uh, or watch or, or, or listen to or read. And so that's a, that's a shift, um, like a, a mental shift. And I've said this before, I think the the product that sort of pioneered this was probably TikTok, where you can literally see that the UI is really just a full screen video feed. It's designed for the AI. It was 100% in, in service of, of the AI. So that's not a shift that we came up with. It's a shift the entire industry is going through, but it's good to be explicit about it. So so that's at the very high level. And then you can, you can geek out about what it means at the end of the road as, as we're trying to model basically a human and its tastes and instincts and so forth. Um, but then if you look at it practically, what that means is you want user interfaces that are better at giving you clear signal. So if you think through um, two types of interfaces, one is sort of the, the Netflix and former Spotify user interface where you have lots of little cover arts all over the screen and you scroll through them. In, in a UI first world, that's that's pretty useful for the user because then they, they can evaluate lots of cover at the same time. So it's efficient. And you, you, you talk often about dense UIs, lots of information on the screen, because from a user perspective, it means the user has to scroll less. You can see many things at the same time. But then if you try to think of it from the AI's perspective, you know, th there is this blog post from Eugene Way called Seeing Like an Algorith Algorithm from like 2022, which I really like. So if you try to think you are the AI, that UI is very difficult because you can't see what the user actually understood. Did they look at all the items? And if they look at them, did they understand what that little square cover art actually meant and represented? Did they evaluate it and say, I'm not interested? Or did they not even see it and you should actually show it again? So if you go to the TikTok UI, it's less efficient for the user. You only see one thing at a time. And to go through 10 items, you have to do 10 swipes. But from the AI's perspective, it is 100% certain that you saw it and if you liked it or not. If you didn't like it, you would swipe. If you liked it, you would stay on it. So it's actually less efficient for the user potentially in the near term, but it's more efficient for the AI, which makes it way more efficient for the user the next time because it understood the user better. So that's a general way of like, how do you rethink UIs in an AI world? We try to make sure that the algorithm understands what the, what the user preferences are. 
more than if you didn't have an AI algorithm. So, so that's one place. And then we also obviously use AI all over the place. The content understanding is a big one. We used to have a problem of recommending a podcast before they got popularity because we didn't know who to recommend them to or if they were safe or unsafe. Now you can use LLMs, you can machine listen to them and classify them both in, in which category they are, which, um, uh, you know, create a vector for them to recommend them and also understand if they're, if they are safe for recommendations and advertising or not. So content understanding is a, is a big, big piece of that too. And then obviously the recommendation algorithms themselves are getting much, much better with these very large embeddings from LLMs versus the much smaller ones that you used to do in the age of collaborative filtering. So that's some of the areas. Just to go back to the <clears throat> UI point really quickly, it strikes me that Spotify would have a little bit of a harder time doing this than other products that have visual media because so much of the consumption and the experience of Spotify is happening in the background. <clears throat> the user has the phone in the pocket or they're listening to Spotify in their car. What are some of the signals you can get when the user isn't actually interfacing with a visual UI? And how do you, how do you filter that back into the AI? Yeah, so that's that's a great point. And that's one of the challenges we actually have there. So if you think about someone listening to playlists in the playlist in the background, and maybe they're driving or something, right? So they're very um interactivity is very expensive for them. You yep. have to bring up your phone, you have to unlock it with your face ID, stuff that you shouldn't even do while you're driving, right? So then if you play a track and the user listens through the whole track, how do you interpret that? It could have been a track that they absolutely loved. And it could have been a track that they hated, but not quite enough to skip through it, right? And it's very hard for the algorithm to understand. So it's exactly this problem of seeing like an algorithm. Now, fortunately for us in music, we have other signals like saves and playlisting, which to your point previously, are super explicit. Not just that you liked it, but also that you liked it in the context of these other songs. So that's why playlisting has been so important for us to bootstrap this, because background listening is a weak signal to learn from. But this is also why you saw us investing in more foreground discovery mechanisms, literally sort of feeds where you can swipe through, you know, uh, canvases and, and hopefully soon music videos of tracks one at a time. So, you know, as you are in, when you are in the foreground, we want more efficient formats to capture as much signal as possible when you're in the foreground, because in the background, it's harder to capture. So we're trying to make sure that we are efficient in the foreground. Uh, that we have the playlisting tools for really explicit uh, curation. And obviously, we're also using the skips and so forth in the background, but it's it's a harder signal to learn fast from. This past year has obviously been crazy. We've seen so much innovation, so many new companies, products, technologies, uh, and it seems like it's moving so fast. Every single week, there's a new model that's out benchmarking the previous model. If I think about that in the context of Spotify uh, and, you know, my time spent there working with you, obviously Spotify is a super, super thoughtful company. You've always said, you've said it internally, and I've heard you say it publicly, talk is cheap, so you should do a lot of it. And, and what you mean, I think, is that, you know, you should really, really take your time and be really thoughtful and strategic. And I think that's reflected in a lot of some of Spotify's biggest initiatives. They were years, years in the making. How have you how have you managed that in this past year and maybe moving forward where things are happening so, so quickly? Like, how do you just keep pace in this new AI first world? Yeah, so what I mean with this um, talk is cheap, so you should do more of it is obviously it's always better to have provocative taglines because <laughs> <laughs> people remember them. Yeah, uh, I remember and, that. And uh, what I mean is it's... Uh, it is expensive to, to just talk and talk and talk if, if you don't have like qualified people and, and structured discussions. But it's also true that it's much cheaper to talk than to build the wrong thing. That, that's what I want to get at. And you can get surprisingly far by debating and discussing. Famously, you know, um, some of the, of the old uh, Greeks came all the way to, to the atom just from like deduction and reasoning that there should be something like an atom out there. Um, so you can get really far by just uh, discussing. That, that's my point. And I think uh, there's been this other culture of, you know, move fast, break things, uh, code decides arguments. That is also obviously valid. There are points to that. But if you go too hard in that direction, you can waste a lot of time going really fast, absolutely nowhere. So you, you need both. That's why I want to push a little bit for, for, for like sort of Socratic debate and, and discussions with strong people. 
And and this is the answer to your question. So one of the challenges now that things move this fast is that it used to be the case that some technology sort of came online. You could see it, you could test it, you could start saying like, oh, what, what products can we build from this? And you would build it for a year or something, and then you shipped it. And that was okay. Now the tricky thing is like, you have to predict where the technology is going to be and start building the things around it, hoping that it matures if you want to be early. Hmm. You have to intercept the technology rather than wait for it. And that makes it tricky. So if you, if you need to intercept it, you need to have reasoning around what products are going to be able to exist, you know, six to 12 months from now um, that doesn't exist yet. And what do we need to build to be able to ship something then? Because if you start once it's live, you know, you're going to be years behind the others. So one of these examples is, for example, the, the AI DJ, where if you followed LLMs closely, you know, the last like, oh, basically all the way since the Transformer paper came out, you could see this, this trajectory. And, and we reasoned internally, you know, we listened to voice models and we said like, they're not very good yet back then. Um, but if this pace continues, they're going to be perfect somewhere between like 12 to 18 months, right? And so what would that mean? What products could you build if you had perfect voice? And on top of that, you could see the LLMs, which back in like GPT-2, were starting to be able to create good sentences, right? But they weren't that good. But then with 3, 3.5 and 4, you could do the same thing. You could say like within something like um, 12 to 18 months, we're going to have things that can produce highly relevant personalized text. And we're going to have things that can articulate that text perfectly as if it was a human. What product could we build? And then we started thinking about this dream we all always had. Like, you know, what if we could have hired like one DJ per user? You know, someone who just knew Mike really well and sat there all night, like going through the catalog and set up a playlist for you. And then in the morning, it's like, hey, good morning, Mike. I've got this thing for you. And, it, and, you know, that would become possible somewhere within one to two years from where we were. So we started investing. And there was a lot of investment in infrastructure we needed to do to be able to do that, um, even though the models weren't there. And so we predicted that. We built a bunch of infrastructure. We started prototyping these products. The text generation was not that good. The audio sounded like a robot. But it took us like 12 months. And during that time, exactly that actually happened. And that's why we managed to launch the AI DJ, you know, early last year, which looked like, you know, right when it happened, uh, which, you know, I was very happy about, but it was actually a year and a half in the making. And it happened to coincide with uh, when the technology matured. So it kind of looked like we saw it and managed to build it overnight, but it took about a year and a half. So, so that's what I think is necessary now, more reasoning and prediction about the future. So like you said, you had to sort of predict what was going to happen. And you probably never could have predicted that it would have launched at the exact same time as ChatGBT or similar. Uh, but it looked genius in retrospect. I, I wonder what that experience now and, and maybe this whole AI wave that's happened over the past year has done to the culture of Spotify and how, how everyone thinks about building products. I mean, are more and more people starting to think this way? What, what does it do to the way people work? I think so. We're having more and more sort of what-if discussions and more and more discussions about not what can be done right now, but what we think can be done in six months or 12 months. And, and in a way, I actually think that, as you said initially, the, the pace of innovation is, is absolutely mind-boggling, right? It's just exploding. And that's true. But in a sense, I feel like the world has gotten more predictable, the AI world, because yeah. During the last five years, when this happened, like the first few years, you you didn't understand any of this. It was very unpredictable. Now, it is more powerful than ever, and it's certainly growing as fast as ever, but it's actually very predictable that it's going to get better. You have the chinchilla papers and so forth. So, you know, OpenAI managed to actually predict how good GPT-4 would be before they yeah. built it. And I think they know how good GPT-5 is going to be as well. And so, in a way... The world is moving faster than ever, which is, makes it harder, but it's also more predictable now uh, how fast it's going to move. Let's talk a little bit about media and content in general. What do you think the creation side is of this? Uh, obviously, there are these you know, image models and video models that people are starting to experiment with, but what's sort of the mature 
view of this and, and where does this go in, you know, two to three years for how we all create media? Yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. And I think you can look at two different types of services. So Spotify, actually both in music, podcast, and books, we're an aggregation service, right? So we, ag- we want to aggregate as many creators as possible to have the biggest possible catalog for our consumers. And then our task is to understand what of this vast catalog the consumer likes and recommend that. Just lowering friction. We didn't innovate music, we didn't innovate podcasts, and we didn't innovate books. But I think what's interesting about, if you look at something like TikTok that we mentioned, is they did a great innovation on the consumption side by this full screen UI that gives like perfect feedback to an explore exploit algorithm. But what I think a lot of people miss, unless you use TikTok a lot as a, as a creator, is they also did a lot of innovation on the creator side, right? So because you create in TikTok, they actually used a ton of AI to drastically lower the creation, the, the friction on the creation side. And they needed to do that because they were not programming an existing format like we do. They were starting a new format, whatever you wanted to call that music sync dance video that originally came from Musical.ly. So actually, they did a lot of innovation on both sides. And I think the the AI innovation on the creator side was probably as important as the AI innovation on the consumer side. Can you give some examples? So like, what are some of the things they did on the creation side? Well, for example, when you, when you, um, when you create a, a talk, you know, it can synchronize the music, right. uh, help you synchronize moves, uh, all, all, all of these things. It's, it's actually very, and increasingly very, very AI driven. And so I think that if you're building a new service now that one, you want to compete with, with YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and so forth, that is the vector. Use AI on the creation side somehow to create a new type of format um, or interaction that drastically changes the cost curve or the friction of creating content. So what I think is going to happen for us is uh, something more traditional, namely that our goal is not to replace the creators, it is to get more creators, <laughs> to make them more productive, right? That is what maximizes the, the value of Spotify for consumers, to have more music, more podcasts, more audiobooks. And I certainly think AI will increase the productivity of musicians, podcasters, and authors. Do you imagine a world in which we talked you know, talk about TikTok and we talked about how they're already using AI to, uh, to help make the creation easier, to establish their own format? If you, just, if you just stick with that trajectory, do you imagine a world in which a platform like TikTok is generating the content themselves and delivering the perfect piece of content at the perfect time? I mean, it's a great question. So I think if you want to start a new company and compete with TikTok, that would be the dream, you know, sort of infinite content at no marginal cost and just generate right. and generate. And you can imagine like a future uh, Netflix where it just generates every possible movie that could be generated and renders it, right? So I can't say that is theoretically impossible. It doesn't seem impossible. Um, I don't think it's very likely though. I think what would happen is more what happened with TikTok, which means that you actually lower the friction to human creation. You make many more people much more powerful and productive. It still seems like you need the human idea. I, I think an example is, if you look at what happened with text generation and audio, it is already today fully possible to generate a fully algorithmic podcast. Just prompt the LLM to have an interesting discussion and then render it. And in fact, it's being done. It's uploaded. I can tell you they're just not very interesting. I can't say exactly why. It could be that it's just like a few more iterations and they will be amazing. But they're, they're not yet. Um, it's, it's hard. I can't argue theoretically why it wouldn't be possible. I just don't see it yet, even though the quality is there. And um, I don't predict that it will happen anytime soon. I, I wonder if it's because, you know, uh, these models are trained on all of the media and content that exists in the world today. And so anything that gets spit out almost, it feels like there's a, there's a ceiling, there's an upper limit, what's already been created. But the greatest works of art fe- always feel like they're reaching new heights, right? People do something innovative or different that you haven't heard before, and it raises the bar. Exactly. These models are sort of hitting the current bar. It, I wonder if that has something to do with it. I think it's a great point, and, and that may be it, that these models are specifically trained to predict and repeat what has already been done exactly. with some variation, whereas what we like are things that never happened before, and it would be harder for these models to do that. I think a machine learning scientist would argue, like, that's not really true. You could have randomization. 
So I, I can't say it's impossible. I can just say it doesn't seem like the case yet. Yeah. So speaking of that, you know, all these models today, they're being trained on the public internet. They're crawling anything that's out there. <clears throat> Oftentimes things that are copyright protected. Um, it feels like training data and training models is the wild west right now. There's just no rules. People are doing whatever they want. Uh, does it stay that way? What What is the future of training data for language models, video models, image models, music models, all these things? What, what does this look like in the future? So I obviously don't have a crystal ball. And I think there are a few, couple of ways to think about it. One is, what do I think will happen in the world? And then also, what is Spotify's view, regardless of what happens in, in the world? And um, I think there is going to be legislation at the end of the day, and and um, people are going to have to adapt to legislation. That will be the the lower bar. And the legislation could be that turns out, you know, it's legal to train on anything. And then I think it's a market economy. Some companies will do that, and then to compete, other companies will, and then that becomes the status quo. It could be that legislation says that that's not the case, that it emerges that, you know, you need to somehow uh, reimburse um uh, or respect people who don't want their data to participate, right? So that will be the the sort of the the lower bar is what legislation um, sort of dictates. And I think it's it's very possible that legislation will dictate a reimbursement model. I, you know, you can compare it to the wild west of of piracy that existed for a while. That doesn't really exist anymore. So I don't think the world has to be in that wild west stage. I think some order will emerge from Spotify's point of view. You know, as I said, our view is to have as many artists as possible on Spotify. And we actually want the artists to create more music, not to replace them. So from our point of view, we certainly respect their data. And, uh, you know, regardless of, of uh, uh, if there are like loopholes that we could and so forth. Um, and I think that's, what, you know, I think that's why Spotify started was because the music model worked for consumers, but not for creators. So I think it'd be a step back to create a model that, again, works for consumers, but not for creators. So certainly for us, the goal is to find a model where you can leverage the new technology and it works for the creator ecosystem. And, but obviously, when disruptions happen, as with piracy, there is often a period of time first where it only works for one side of the marketplace. But that's not long-term sustainable. Yeah, it seems like there could be legislation, but it it almost seems impossible to build a system that could actually pull this off. So I, I don't know. I'm just, I just wonder how that would play out. Maybe that's where uh, crypto some, comes back. I was just going to say, yeah, some people uh, like like Fred Wilson have recently said that uh, you know this could be the the application for the blockchain, right? So everything, every piece of content that gets created basically gets minted to the chain to the blockchain and you can basically tr trace the provenance of a piece of content all the way back that's i, th I actually think it's a, an interesting use case yeah I, I don't think he's wrong i think it's yeah. potentially i mean for ai in general so, so one of the problems you say like it's so complicated right already because there's the artist there's the songwriters you know, yeah mechanical rights performing rights so you have so many different people involved but it's only complex because you have humans doing it if that was on a blockchain, it's, it's not you can you can make a billion transactions, you know, per per day. It's it's actually not. It's just uh, it's just computation. Right. So I think if you instrumented it programmatically, you could solve it. It just looks very complicated to humans. So I think he's right in that. And and in general, I think the problem of uh, authenticity, traceability, and uh, who is who. <laughs> You know what? What is the fake content versus not? It is potentially one of the big applications for the for the blockchain. I agree with them on that. And and it also seems like it would be made so much harder because there's so much content that exists today that was probably inspired by some other work that that we don't have record of anywhere, right? I mean, this is yeah. this this almost maps to the existing uh, royalty and, uh, and infrastructure we have in music today, which is so exactly. so messy, right? And it's across so many different systems. Uh, I don't know. This this almost sounds like an unsolvable problem, but I'm sure uh, I'm sure some smart people will figure it out. Uh, let's let's talk about ChatGPT and sort of AI's impact on on kind of product and business. Um, ChatGPT was obviously the biggest story of the year last year. Uh, you know, reported to have in the hundreds of millions of users, generating north of a billion dollars annually in revenue. 
it, it, pretty, it feels pretty like, impressive first year. Yeah, and cr crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, and and so everyone talks about it like ChatGPT is sort of the iPhone of AI. It's like it was the iPhone moment. But you know, something uh, that strikes me about this is 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 it's a text conversation, right? You're chatting with an agent, and text as a UI it seems like an outdated primitive, right? It feels like sort of a weird primitive to build a whole new platform and interface on top of. What do you think of that? So I agree. Uh, I think the premise that people use is, you, you see it with um, you know, the demos of, for example, the, the new um, uh, Rabbit hardware. Yeah. Like the, the paradigm that everyone is looking for is intelligence replaces apps or replaces separate UIs. And and where does that come from? Well, if you if, you know if you have like a if you have an executive assistant, for example, you know then you can you can say that you want something achieved, and that person can work across several services and UIs to achieve that task, right? So I think it's a very rational thought that re, you know intelligence would replace the need for several different apps, and and I think the best analogy is to anthropomorphize it and say like if you had a really smart person helping you or working for you, what could you achieve? And then you could assume that AI could probably achieve that if it just keeps scaling. So, so that seems um, pretty reasonable to me. But I also think that people take it too far. Uh, and, and, you know, anthropomorphizing has its benefits because you can predict the future. Like, okay, so if I can do this with a very smart friend now, and you think AI is going to get that smart in a year, then, okay, I can build that product in a year. So it's helpful. But the problem with anthropomorphizing is that it can, you can only predict what a human could have done, not what an AI that can also read images or is much faster than a human could have done or, or, or you know, um, that can also render images or, or, you know, generate it. So it limits you. I think it's both useful to anthropomorphize in the near term. I think it's dangerous to anthropomorphize and think it can only do what a, human, what a single human could have done in the long term because it can probably do much more and things that a human could never do, right? So... I think an interesting example is, and, and the framework that I use is, if you take that path of like, you know, I, I need to use five apps to complete this task. Now I have this UI, this AI that I can talk to through text or voice, and it completes them, whether it uses API or, or it uses sort of a, these, uh, uh, you know, it interacts directly with the, with the UI, as for example, the, the rabbit uh, action model. It doesn't really matter. I think that seems very likely to work for productivity tasks hmm. where there is something you didn't want to do. That gets a lot better, right? But, and, and it works with the anthropomorphization. Like you ask someone else to do it because you didn't want to do it. But I don't think it's that helpful when you think about entertainment. Like hmm. It makes no sense for me to ask my friend, like, could you just go and watch Netflix for me for a while? Because I really don't have time. Or like, can you go and listen to Spotify? <laughs> like the whole point with entertainment, I, I think it works where you want to save time. Productivity is about saving time. Entertainment is about wasting time. So I don't think it is a very good framework for entertainment services. Mm -hmm. And so an example would be, if you look at something like Spotify, of course you could say like, hey, Spotify, play this song. But that's a very narrow use case. And, and you can already do that with like a Google Home or something. But if you imagine that you had to say like, hey, AI, can you go and scroll through the front page and tell me what you see so that I can choose something? Then a visual UI is going to kick ass. It's going to be so much more effective because it's two-dimensional. You have images, right? So I do not think that text will replace visual UIs. That doesn't make any sense to me. I think that's taking it too far. Uh, I still think like a user interface that can present images, moving pictures, you know, and, and actually play sound is going to be vastly better than an AI in between that tries to relate what you would have seen if you looked at the UI, right? So personally, I don't think, uh, you know, a Netflix or a Spotify or Instagram is going gonna, is gonna to sort of disappear into the background and be disintermediated by a text box. It doesn't really make sense from a productivity point of view, because you're not trying to save time. You're actually trying to waste time. I, what I think is exciting, though, so if you don't anthropomorphize and you think instead, what could a maximum product be? Not what could have a human have done if you talked to them over the phone. Right. But if you said, like, which is a helpful model for some productivity tasks, but not for entertainment, I think. You know, the, the promise is an AI 
that can understand your intent when you speak um, and other inputs if you have them. But I, I certainly think voice is a, you know, text is a very strong input. But it can also render user interfaces that are much more dynamic. You know, today user interfaces have to be very uh, specific and repetitive because they're, they're not generated on demand, right? They're, they're pre-programmed. So you have to think through, you know, which views you want in an app and so forth. You could imagine far into the future, because these things can generate code, if you squint a little bit, you could almost imagine that you're simulating an app like Spotify, and it's re- literally like rendering the app or the code in real time. And I don't think... Totally it will dynamic go, UI. Totally yeah, dynamic. I don't think it will go that far, but you could go some ways. You could have, like, the search view could start becoming more dynamic. And sometimes mm-hmm. it renders images, if that's helpful for the search result. Sometimes it renders text fields. So you could imagine that the whole thing gets more dynamic and intelligent. Do you think the starting point for applications, though, become either text to voice? Like, is that now the new home screen, right? You, you go to your computer, your phone, and it's, a, and it's just a prompt, right? And that sort of starts everything or whatever you're going to be doing, be it wasting time or spending time or saving time. No, I don't think so. Because, yeah. a, again, a prompt is only helpful if you know exactly what you want to do. If you have right. a task in mind that you want to do faster, an input box is great. Um, but, but, you know, then, then if you take that, if you think that's enough, then Spotify should just be the search box on the front right. page. Right. And, and we know we've, we've tried. If you, if you, if you put the search box there, people struggle what to listen yeah. to, right? People don't know what they want to do all the time. So I don't think it will be only that, but I do think that will be a, just a search is a big, big part of any service. Right. It will be a big part of your life for many tasks. And, and back to like anthropomorphizing. Think through, like, if you had a super highly intelligent, very effective friend, you know, that worked for you for free, what would you use them for versus what wouldn't you use them for? You know, people are talking about AI as a platform shift and trying to compare it to previous platform shifts. Oh, it's the new iPhone. Oh, it's the new cloud computing. I I tend to think of it as a resource like capital or labor or or work, right? Um, do you see it the same way? And sort of how do you think it'll impact the business model of software moving forward? So I do see it sort of the same way. I think it's good to try to think about it as something different. I think uh, one way to think about um, AI is that, you know, we, we have a mechanical labor and that, that has been automated. And what's happening now is that sort of cognitive labor is being automated. Uh, and it's a good framework to think through you know, what happened when mechanical labor got automated and then try to figure out what might happen when cognitive labor gets automated. So it's like cognitive machines in addition to sort of mechanical uh, machines. I think thinking of it as as literally intelligence, like units of intelligence is interesting. So, you know, if you, it sounds weird, like what do you mean with units of intelligence? And like, you know, you're buying units of intelligence on tap. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. And then you think about your HR department and what they're doing, and they're hiring like units of intelligence every day. That's what you're doing. You're trying to get as much intelligence into your company as possible, right? And you're paying a lot for the best intelligence. And you have all these tests, you know, to figure out, you know, and, and the, the at the core, the way you try to compete as a company is to have the most intelligence in-house. People talk about talent density and so forth, right? And so if you think about it like that, it is intelligence, but now you can buy it sort of on tap or per unit. Then, then I think um, that's, that can be helpful. Because the tricky thing to your point is it, it is so general. Yeah, Intelligence is by definition completely general. They almost need to think of it as some sort of resource. And so I literally think of it as, as intelligence. But you get intelligence... And you get execution, right? In a sense, for for certain tasks. Yeah. So it, it it really is, it it the HR department hiring hiring people is is a is a really helpful analogy. Um, it's scary to think just how massive uh, it could be in this new in this new framework in this new model. I I think what's going to happen sort of to sort of preempt the question maybe of of uh, labor. And so forth. Because you could say like, oh, now you can buy intelligence. The second that's one cent cheaper than hiring intelligence, you're only going to use computers. I don't think that's going to happen. It's the same as with musicians. That's not what we see today. Mm. What we do see very clearly 
is like a developer with Copilot is more productive than a developer without. Yeah. So if you can buy more intelligence for that developer, you, you know, if you, if you do a Ray Kurzweil and said like, hey, the, the nanobots are here, you can now buy neocortex in the cloud. Yep. Would you as a company buy more neocortex for your developers? Yes, you would. And I think buying Copilot is like a weak analogy of buying more neocortex for your developer. And so I think companies are going to start spending more and more on their existing staff to make them more and more productive. But I don't think in this competitive econo economy, you're actually going to reduce your labor force because then someone else is going to take their, their OPEX and, and uh, outcompete you. So I think the pressure is to make your existing workforce more and more productive. Speaking of intelligence, uh, GBT-5 is on the horizon. Um, what, what do you think the impact of this is going to be? How much, how much more intelligent do you think it's going to be or, or feel than uh, what we experience today? I mean, I don't know. We've lived through a couple of these now with GPT-2, yeah. GPT-3, 3.5 with RLHF and then GPT-4. So to my previous point, in a way, I think it's pretty predictable that you will be blown away. <laughs> so you won't be as blown away because you sat there and expected to be blown away. It's this weird thing when someone tells you a movie is amazing, you're not as impressed as if you had no expectations. So personally, I'm expected, expecting to be blown away <laughs> and I probably will be. Uh, but that yeah. actually means it's more predictable. What I think is, I mean, I don't know that much, or actually I know almost nothing at all about GPT-5. I only know what most people know. Um, my expectation is that it is more predictable because it's now going to get predictably better at existing dimensions. What, what happened the previous times was that you had these emergent capabilities where it did completely new things, right? And that is what surprised us. You know, when you have like chain of thought, you're like, oh, Jesus, this thing is reasoning, right? And it, it couldn't do math at all, like not at all. It couldn't do one plus two. And then it's like, oh, it can do math now. You can reason around math and theory. So I don't think we'll get us as surprised. I'm hoping I'm wrong here. Be interesting. But I don't think we'll be as surprised about completely new capabilities. We'll be blown away by how good the existing capabilities got. You know, they will be way past most humans. And I think you see this. Why am I saying this? Well, because if you look at the tests that are out there, these models now are pretty good at almost all human capabilities. So I don't actually know what it would be that emerged that it can't do at all anymore. It can sort of do everything, but it is, if you, if you compare it to image recognition, there was this, you know, forever image recognition didn't get any better. Like it barely couldn't recognize images at all. It was close to random bef before sort of deep learning came along. And then this race started and it got better than, than like random. And then you got 60, 70, 80, 90, 95%, 96, 97%. And actually humans are only like something like 96, 97% and it beat humans. And, and I think we're already on that ramp up trajectory of the dimensions itself, whether it's uh, reasoning around, you know, physics and math or, or um, taking SATs or talking about uh, legislation or, or something like that. So I, I would be, what would surprise me is some completely new ability that we hadn't seen at all. What I'm expecting is to be blown away by how good the existing capabilities now are. And, you know, hallucinations will be very few and far between. The reasoning capabilities will be much stronger. You can uh, probably, you know, reason for, for long, spend many tokens on getting to deeper reasoning. Um, what, what would be really cool, which is very speculative, I think, is uh, I think a lot of people <laughs> in AI in general, for, for obvious reasons, are very interested in math. And I think like theoretical math is like the, the ultimate frontier. Can you create new math proofs that didn't exist before? So, so maybe one of, the, one of the abilities, if I'm going to correct myself, that isn't really proven yet is can you actually make something new that didn't exist? Hmm. And um, some people would say, of course you can. You just raise the temperature a bit and then you get some text that never existed. This is new. Other people would say like, ah, oh, it's not really new. You know, I want some sort of deductive reasoning, like a law of physics, not just something that was very close to the law of physics or something that existed. And I think what is interesting now is, you know, these models are starting to get this ability to reason at a higher level. Some people claim it's not reasoning. 
is just sort of faking reasoning. Other people claim it's reasoning, but if you accept that it is reasoning for a while, if you, if you, um, or if you uh, pretend that it is reasoning for a while, then you have this emergent space on top of of just the pattern recognition that is happening, and you could imagine sort of doing something like reinforcement learning on that space where you ask it to reason through hundreds of thousands or millions of possible math theorems based on everything you learn about math. But the beauty of math is you can then test if the theory if the theorem was true. It's one of these uh, you know one-way functions that is uh, hard to come up with but easy to prove if it's true. It's it's like crypto, right? You know, it's very hard to 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 um, to break it, but you can very very quickly verify it if it's true. So then you could imagine this uh, agent that using an LLM tries to reason through just brute force reason through you know, all possible math theorems, sort of randomly like a reinforcement learning process, but it can verify. And, and it's going to random, it's going to reason based on pattern recognition, like it's seen this type of reasoning before. And maybe it could come up with math proofs that just never existed before. And then you could verify offline that they were true theorems. Hmm. Uh, that might happen. I, I think an interesting analogy here is uh, this mathematician named uh, Ramanujan, uh, Indian mathematician who is, um, is, a, is a great movie capturing this, but basically he grew up very poorly in India. So self-taught mathematician just on the, on the streets of, of um, I don't remember which city in India, but he somehow developed this incredibly strong instinct for, for math. And it was discovered by, um, his math was discovered by some British uh, mathematicians and he was sort of brought to England. Um, and it, but he had never learned proper math. So his theorems came to him in dreams from a god. And so when he was asked, like, how do you know this theorem is true? He answered, well, of course it's true. Like a god told me, right? <laughs> and it turned out that actually many of his theorems were true, but not all wow. of them. And then he learned formal math and he could figure out how to prove which of his dreams were, were true. So you could imagine AI. And, and what is cool about Ramanujan is, I think most mathematicians would say that math is not pattern recognition. It is true logical reasoning. But then you can't explain Ramanujan. He didn't have the logical reasoning, the formal math. He just had dreams. So maybe even math is sort of exploring, exploration of pattern recognition. But then you need this mechanism of formal math to verify which is true. So that's a long-winded answer of maybe math will be the thing that surprises us with right. GPT-5. OpenAI keeps talking about how AGI is coming. You know, we're getting closer and closer. Uh, maybe that'll be GPT-5. Um, but at this point, like, does the what is AGI and does the definition even matter? I mean, you mentioned, you know, the models are reasoning. Um, are they reasoning or does it just seem like reasoning? And do, like I said, does it even matter? Uh, if, if we imagine that it's reasoning, isn't it kind of the same thing as it is reasoning? So I actually think you're right in that it doesn't matter. <laughs> I think... Uh... If you ask about the definition of AGI or, or even just I, intelligence, I think the best definition I've heard is probably Marcus Hutter's of Hutter Price fame. And he says that intelligence is the ability to achieve complex goals in a wide variety of environments, which sounds like a mouthful, but it's actually pretty straightforward. It's just uh, the ability to achieve goals, complex goals in different settings. And humans are at some level on that spectrum. And actually, we're not at the same level. Uh, Einstein was quite a bit sharper than the rest of us, right? So it's not even a level, to your point of like, does it really matter? So I don't think it matters. I think we've had uh, super intelligence among us, you know, the Einsteins of the world. And that, that is also pretty promising because we seem to be doing fine. You know, he came up with relativity and you can argue that new innovations... Uh, you know, like nuclear and so forth came out of that. And, and maybe that will ruin us someday. But uh, but certainly, everyone doesn't have the same intelligence. We're, we're on the spectrum there. And that seems to work. It's unclear what happens if you go really, 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 really far on that spectrum. I can't say that I know. But for that reason, I, I agree with you. I don't think just passing like the human level really matters. Yeah. Because some humans already passed the average human level. Achieving goals in a wide variety of environments is interesting. It makes me think of um, 
these products like, well, products like the rabbit and, and more broadly, um, this notion of an action model, right? Everything yeah. right now we're talking about language models, the rabbit, uh, and you know, people that are thinking about, uh, that type of innovation are talking about action models. When do you think we're going to make the leap from generation of content and, and writing and images and all this stuff to action taking and, and what will be sort of the nearest term implications of this? Well, I think, you know, to your point of, of the rabbit and so forth, like it's already happening just very early. So, you know, it, one answer would be next week, maybe, <laughs> who yeah. knows? But but I, my point is, I think it's quite imminent. I, I think um, someone more skeptical would say like, well, we've had the idea of agents for a good while now, and they're really cool, but they're not that useful yet. I think that's also fair. Um, but it, But it seems pretty straightforward that at least, you know, semi-specialized agents that help you complete like something that would have required two tasks or three tasks or four tasks for specific use cases like traveling like i don't see how it couldn't happen so i think these agents are sort of going to sneak up on us and i'm not sure i'm not so sure you're going to realize that you're talking to an agent it might just look like when you used to talk to three services you're now just talking to one and it's three behind the scenes right and then you know do we get very general agents that does everything for you? Or is it going to be that, you know, each uh, sort of service has its own, has its own agent? I don't know. But but I think like action transformers and taking actions is going to happen very soon. I, I know that inside companies, I think Amazon published a paper this fall where, where they are talking about sort of these orchestrator LLMs. You know, from having worked at Spotify that a backend in machine learning is usually like, it's not the algorithm. It's actually like hundreds of different mini algorithms, right? They're all like individually tuned and so forth. And then together, they sort of produce something <laughs> uh, that is that is almost like alchemy. You, you don't know how these all these different algorithms are going to interact with each other. So you try to tune and understand. But the result looks like an algorithm. It's actually many algorithms. I think that is changing. I think people are starting to put these sort of... Uh, orchestrator LLMs in front of their system that actually is more akin to like a single brain or algorithm that does take all the signals from you and understands that, looks at, you know, the embeddings of your user history, for example, and then tries to talk to your APIs. So there's a layer in between the user and your APIs, which is an LLM that says like, oh, Mike is now saying this to his uh, Alexa or typing this into Spotify or something. And then the LLM, instead of hard-coded rules for what will happen now? Call this API and that API. The LLM says like, well, based on what Mike said and reasoning through chain of thought, I should probably call this API and do this for Mike and then this and then send this back to the screen. And that is an agent. You don't see it. You're not going to understand it's an agent, but it is an agent inside something like Spotify that reasons through what you did in the UI and actually talks to the backend. So I can see a future where a company builds like lots of capabilities, lots of APIs internally, and then just has a really big LLM fronting the user. And the LLM actually reasons through which APIs to call and what to do for the user, which is pretty cool because it could then do things that the programmer didn't necessarily predict, if you understand what I mean. And I think certainly mm -hmm. if you want to build a voice assistant, that seems uh, much more scalable than, than building these one-off custom flows for every possible use right. case that you could imagine, right? So I think agents are coming in various forms and they're sort of already here in some forms, even though you don't yeah. see them. You know, speaking of agents and taking actions and AGI, um, you know, I, I think about uh, this analogy that uh, Ilya from OpenAI gave about the the risk uh, of AI, uh, comparing it to the threat of of humans to animals. Right, when humans have a goal that indirectly impacts animals, you know, humans often don't stop to think about that impact. Yeah, how do you think about AI and agents taking actions uh, when the threat or the risk of the actions they take impact humans? Yeah, so I would just start up by saying, I'm not particularly concerned about the existential risk that, that many people are for various reasons. And you, know, you probably shouldn't listen to me because I'm not really an AI expert, but I am more concerned about the practical risks in the near term. Okay. Um, you know, it's like when you introduce anything new, whether it's like a, you know, cigarettes, but that's a bad analogy because it's only bad. Like cars, 
was going to have some negative effect on people's health because they stopped walking, right? I think there will be consequences. I think it's dumb to be naive and say that this is the one technology which has no risks and will have no consequences. Of course, there will have consequences and there are risks. So first of all, I want to say, I think it's very reasonable to be careful and invest in safety. And back to prediction, don't just try to predict the good things that could come, which are many, like AlphaFold and solving cancer and so forth. I think that will happen. But also try to predict the bad things and try to prevent them. That seems very reasonable to me. But on the time scale, I'm more worried about the near-term dumb AIs than, yeah. than the potential risk of the very smart future AIs. And uh, so one question to ask yourself is, do you think the problem with the world today is that we have too much intelligence or too little? And if you ask me that question, you know, are, are you most worried about the most intelligent people around you or the least intelligent people around you, which cause the most havoc? And uh, if you think about, you know, Ilya's point about who cares about other species, is it that, you know, it seems like it's the smartest among us are the ones who seem to sort of care the most for other species because they understand that actually, if, if that bee over there goes extinct, eventually that's my environment and my climate. If you're smart and really understand causality or at least correlation very deeply, you're going to get more careful. It's actually when you're not that smart that you're dangerous, right? So from a very high level, I would think that more intelligence is a good thing in the world. The problem isn't that we have too much intelligence, I think. Um, so one, maybe the problem is to get these AIs smart enough hmm. to start caring about and understanding its full ecosystem, including the humans that actually are building and powering it. This isn't even smart from an AI to make humans go extinct. Certainly not too soon, right? So if you took in the very far future where somehow the AIs are fully self-sufficient, they run and build somehow all the factories with robots, then maybe, but I think that's extrapolating too far. In, in the foreseeable future, it would be very dumb for the AI. It's only if it doesn't understand enough that it's going to make humans extinct. So maybe the big risk are the stupid AIs. And I don't know, but this is very speculative, but you know, humans created empathy as sort of a feeling. And you can argue that that's sort of some sort of divine good. Uh, but if you're, if you're not sort of creationist, it has to have emerged from evolution somehow. There must be some benefit to empathy. Mm. And I think that since these, you know, since these things are trained on our thoughts, and the task is to predict what we, you know, what we think, what comes next. And empathy seems to be a very important part of how we reason. If you read all the text on the internet and you try to predict the next token, if you want to predict how we think and how we come to our conclusions in these sentences, it doesn't seem unlikely to me that these models would, would develop or at least emulate something like empathy in order to achieve its goals, right? And I think this is an, sort of an important point I want to make, that while people like Max Tegmark and others, they often call this an alien intelligence, right? And, and it scares people. It's like there's an, the aliens already landed on Earth. They're here now. It's called AI. I don't think that's the right way to, to think about it. I actually think it's the opposite. This, is, this intelligence is literally physically modeled on our brains and neurons. We really looked at the at the brain and, and you know, first, for, foremost, the eyes. And we modeled the artificial neuron, uh, neuron after the biological. So physically, it's modeled after us. And then we trained it on all our thoughts, exactly how we reason. So this is probably by far the most human intelligence we'll ever encounter because it is physically built, it works physically like human intelligence, and it is also trained on human intelligence. So... You know, I think calling this alien intelligence is the wrong way to think about it. An alien intelligence would be something vastly different. Uh, everything we see is that these things get more and more like us. So if it's smart enough and it tries to model us, hopefully it will understand its ecosystem, just as we are beginning to do now that we're getting smarter as a society and we're trying to correct our ways instead of eradicating ourselves. So, so that's how I think about it. Gustav, this is a fascinating way to end the conversation and frankly, an optimistic one. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the time today. You are, you are a very busy person, so we really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. This was a great conversation. 
Thanks for listening to my conversation with Gustav for Generative Now. If you liked what you heard, please do us a favor and rate and review the episode. And most importantly, please subscribe to the show so you get notifications every time we come out with a new episode. All that stuff really does help. And if you'd like to learn more, you can follow Lightspeed at Lightspeed VP on YouTube, Twitter X, LinkedIn, Instagram, anywhere else. Generative Now is produced by Lightspeed in partnership with Pod People. I am Michael Magnano, and we will be back soon with another fascinating conversation. See you later.